These next few segments kind of read like they were written by someone who had other places to be, but let's see how this goes, shall we? Going back to thousands of years ago, after Lei Shen got exploded in Old Doom, but before the Pandaren rose up in rebellion, the Mogu had moved their imperial seat to the Vale of Eternal Blossoms, ruling from Mogushan Palace, and pretty much just abusing the waters of the Vale that whole time. So after the Pandaren rose up, the August Celestial sealed the Vale, to prevent anyone else from abusing its resources. But anyway, Anduin and his allies were successful in Zhuen's trial at the Temple of the White Tiger, but there wasn't really any time to celebrate that. Despite them being utterly exhausted, the Vale was now open, and that reopening had already drawn the attention of the Pandaren's ancient enemies. A Mogu warmonger named Zhao Jin, the Bloodletter, had been gathering a large force for quite a while, waiting for this very moment, plotting to claim the sacred waters of the Vale and restore the Mogu Empire. So, the Golden Lotus immediately asked Horde and Alliance champions to lend a hand and help with the Vale's defense. And with assistance from the August Celestials, the champions managed to thin the Mogu numbers quite a bit. However, Zhao Jin was not deterred. He launched a surprise attack, sneaking a buttload more Mogu warriors through a secret passageway into the Vale, and those invaders made it all the way to the steps of Mogushan Palace. But again, the champions managed to catch up with those bastards, defeat Zhao Jin, and put a stop to that attempt. But the Mogu were relentlessly committed to not buggering off. So another one immediately rose up, named Jin. This weapon master rallied the remaining Mogu under his banner, launching yet another invasion, and this time they made it all the way inside to the heart of Mogushan Palace. The Golden Lotus asked the Alliance and Horde champions to get on in there, so they did tracking Jin down and finally defeating the last of his forces. And with that, the veil was preserved. For now. So Anduin Rin and the champions moved on. There were many other things to get through. For example, the Shadowpan Monastery. The Shadowpan monks had stood guard over this place for centuries, because beneath it, three Shah were buried. Violence, anger and hatred. Up until recently, keeping those Shah confined had been well within the Shadowpan's ability. But there'd been an awful lot of bullshit happening around Pandaria since the outsiders had arrived on its shores. So the Shadowpan monks and Taranju were having a bit of a hard time controlling their frustration. The moment Taranju returned to the monastery from the Temple of the White Tiger, the three Shah summoned their strength and burst forth from their prisons. The Shah of Anger fled the temple completely to ravage the countryside every 10 to 20 minutes or so, whilst the other two remained with violence bending its will to the destruction of the monastery, whilst hatred wormed its way into Taranju's weakened heart. Fortunately, Ban Bearheart had been very suspicious of the Shadowpan ever since they'd been a no-show at the Battle of Ox's Gate, so he and a contingent of Horde and Alliance champions marched right into the monastery and started kicking ass and taking names. They defeated the Shah of Violence, but the Shah of Hatred cheesed it, releasing its hold on Taranju in the process. The leader of the Shadowpan was grateful for the assist, but was equally ashamed of the chaos that hatred had worked through him. Riddled with guilt, Taranju left the Shadowpan Monastery and head to the Townlong Steps, determined to find and defeat the Shire of Hatred, whilst the champions head back outside, down the mountain, and waited for the Shire of Anger to spawn so they could try and get a rare mount from it or something. It was at this point that apparently a whole bunch of events occurred in the Townlong Steps Zone. The Yongol had been driven out of Kunlai Summit, but was still launching small skirmishes at the Serpent's Spine, pushing at the barrier's defences, fighting with a noticeable fury that was unusual, even for them. The reason for that should be pretty obvious. They'd now fallen under the influence of the Shire of Hatred, who had cheesed it into this region. It wasn't long before the minds of the Yongol became completely consumed, which led to them turning on one another, indiscriminately slaughtering both friend and foe. These Yongol needed to calm the hell down. So the champions of both factions got involved again, marching into the town long steps to kick more ass and take more names. Unfortunately, as they entered into the zone and started to push the Yongol back, they uncovered signs of mantid attacks. The insectoids were regrouping. Ban Bearheart sent runners to Taranju at the Gaoran battlefront with word of these developments. But the leader of the Shadowpan was very aware of this danger already because the Shadowpan outpost at the front was under attack by the Mantid, and had been for days. The Pandaren were not doing well in this onslaught. The Shire of Hatred was going to have to wait. So, 
the champions marched south, and a fierce battle ensued. However, just as the tide of the battle started to turn, the Mantid unleashed a little surprise they'd been preparing. A Kuiperite worm named Norvakes. The Pandaren's blockade bent and buckled against the weight of the worm, but champions managed to draw its attention away, and then they kicked some names and took some ass. With that dealt with, Taran Zhu could return his attention back to his real goal, eliminating the Shire of Hatred. The beast had barricaded itself inside the last remaining bastion of the Mantid within the region, a Kaipari tree known as Sikves. But that tree did nothing to stop Taran Zhu and his allies. They stormed the place, defeating both the Mantid and the Shah within a paragraph of this book before we just immediately move on to something else. After that, Shadowpan's scouts were sent into the Dread Wastes to investigate why the Mantid had gone into a frenzy a decade before they were supposed to. But in the meantime, another crisis arose within the town long steps. At the Temple of the Black Ox, home to the August Celestial Nizao, Mantid were amassing yet again, and yet another Shah was playing silly buggers with the place. The Shah of Fear. After freeing itself from its ancient shackles, it had immediately possessed the most commanding being it could find in the area, the Mantid Grand Empress, Shekzir, which in turn meant that Fear now had an army of Mantid under its complete control. After almost immediately winning every other conflict they'd been involved with for this entire video, the champions realised they were no match for this one. They were going to need an army of their own. The heroes of both factions returned to the Vale. The valley itself had been secured from the Mogu, but there were now Mantid pushing against the Gate of the Setting Sun, which is yet another gate on the Serpent Spine, acting as a boundary between the Vale and the Dread Wastes. And after working their way through that apparently insignificant dungeon that doesn't even warrant a small summary, the champions managed to establish a foothold in the Dread Wastes themselves, only to immediately come across a very curious sight, a Klaxi Elder battling another Mantid. The champions stepped in, but the Elder had been mortally wounded, and with his dying breath, he begged said champions to release another, currently encased in amber nearby. Confused, the heroes went ahead and did that. This was kind of weird, because the Mantid was supposed to be the bad guys. But upon releasing the preserved Mantid, one Kilrock the Windreaver, the champions discovered that these peeps were part of a Klaxi faction, which opposed Grand Empress Shexia. So that was pretty convenient. Now the Klaxi were the council of the Mantid's wisest leaders, stewards of their people's history and culture. Kilrock himself was a paragon, which are the elite warriors preserved in amber that were mentioned during the Valley of the Four Winds section in the last video. As far as Kilrock and the elders were concerned, it was for the good of the Mantid that Grand Empress Shexia and her reckless incursions beyond the Serpent's Spine be bloody stopped. Their civilization was buckling under the weight of fighting a war on so many fronts. They simply could not afford to continue fighting. Kilrock went ahead and brought the champions before the full Klaxi Council, some of which were a little bit tentative. Not only were these beings outsiders, but apparently Mantid are a little bit racist as well. However, the Klaxi leader Klaxivar Vor convinced his fellows to trust these invaders, and then asked Kilrock to direct them onto the places they should go to awaken the rest of the Mantid paragons around the region. One by one, the players roused these fabled warriors, convincing them all to join the cause, and backed by this elite force, Horde champions then did the Heart of Fear raid and get credit for that. However, although they managed to defeat the Empress, the Shah of Fear cheesed it, eluding capture. And apparently the Horde champions were now tired, so the Alliance then got involved, tracking the creature from the Dread Wastes, through the Valley of the Four Winds, back to the edge of the Jade Forest, and then into a tiny little region called the Veiled Stair. Out of sheer desperation, the Shah of Fear corrupted the mightiest fortress it could find in the area, the Terrace of Endless Spring, a peaceful monastery which served as a place of remembrance for Emperor Shao Hao. It was from here that Shao Hao had given up his physical form and severed Pandaria from the rest of the world, and ironically, it was now up to outsiders to defend this place. The Alliance champions marched inside, taking ass and kicking dicks. They cleansed the place of corruption and beat the shit out of the Shah of Fear. But with the death of Fear, six of the seven Prime Shah had been dealt with. Only Pride remained. But Pride was a clever little bitch. Whilst the others had recklessly attacked Pandaria's temples, Pride was simply biding its time. Now back to some more character-focused stuff for a bit. Whilst the champions had been running around like maniacs, killing everyone they could find, Garrosh Hellscream had arrived in Pandaria, making landfall on a small island off the coast of the Krasarang Wilds. 
He ordered his soldiers to build a massive fortress, which would act as a base for future Horde conquests, and he called this place Domination Point. This order and the construction of the fortress further concerned the other leaders of the Horde, with Vol'jin expressing his concerns to the War Chief directly. Garrosh's aggression and idle threats would only further alienate the Pandaren from the Horde and its cause. However, Garrosh did not give a shit what Vol'jin thought and was also kind of pissed off at the direct opposition. Sometime later, Vol'jin and the War Chief's elite guards went on a mission to obtain a powerful weapon in their fight against the Alliance. They soon came upon the power which Garrosh sought, Mogu flesh-shaping magic, magic that had been used to create the Saurok race. Vol'jin immediately denounced the use of this magic, claiming it to be way too bloody dark. So Garrosh's minions leapt upon the Dark Spear leader, intent on murdering the guy. And they would have succeeded too, if not for a Horde champion intervening. Though they did manage to poison Vol'jin a little bit. After defeating the War Chief's guards, Vol'jin urged the champion to lie, inform the War Chief that the Dark Spear chieftain was dead, stay close to Garrosh, learn his plan, and find others sympathetic to rebellion. And with that, Vol'jin and the champion parted ways. Under the impression that he'd silenced his greatest critic, Garrosh then moved to secure his power over the Horde. He needed to do something, otherwise the Dark Spear trolls would discover what had happened and seek revenge. So, he ordered Horde troops to surround the Echo Isles, locking the Dark Spears within their own home. And with them contained, Garrosh started to believe that no one could stand against him. Meanwhile, a bunch of Pandaren children discovered Vol'jin's half-drowned body floating in the river near Binan village, with Chen Stormstout retrieving the bloke and patching him up because he'd actually met Vol'jin before and they were kind of friends. I'll get to that in a minute. But Vol'jin's natural ability to heal was being impeded by the poison from his would-be assassins. And although Chen did manage to remove the poison, Vol'jin was still having a hard time and was mostly unconscious. Chen transported unconscious Vol'jin to the Shadowpan Monastery due to them being a neutral group in Pandaria. And during this time, the Dark Spear Chieftain roused long enough to utter two words. Find Thrall. Now Thrall, who had now finished his shamaning at the Maelstrom, had returned to settle into a quiet life in the Valley of Trials. And he was enjoying this quiet life. He and his life mate Agra were starting a family. Everything was great. So when Vol'jin's message arrived, he was bloody devastated. Although he cherished his new life, he could not stand idly by whilst Garrosh ruined the horde they'd worked so hard to build. So, off he went, to the Echo Isles. As a little side note, some years before the Horde and Alliance's arrival in Pandaria, Chen Stormstow had travelled the world, having a little explore, and during his time abroad, he'd crossed paths with many Horde leaders, including Vol'jin. Chen had actually assisted the Dark Spears in defending their home at one point from Kol Tiran invaders, and in doing so, saw somewhat of a kindred spirit in the young troll leader. And they hung out with each other a whole bunch, going on hunts together, slaying powerful beasts, whilst trading stories. Until eventually, with a heavy heart, Chen left the Echo Isles and carried on travelling, not really ever expecting to see his old friend ever again. Anyway, news of Vol'jin's disappearance spread quickly throughout the Horde. The Blood Elves and Tauren in particular were not happy whilst most of the orcs and bilgewater goblins were fairly unmoved, remaining loyal to the war chief. But still, Garrosh was unconcerned with the way his horde was beginning to fracture. All he cared about was a decisive victory over the alliance in Pandaria. But to achieve this, he needed some kind of edge, something to empower his soldiers. So when he learned of the Divine Bell, he was very excited. During Lei Shen's reign, his Karun spellweavers had crafted an enchanted bell a bell that would fill the ringer's allies with anger and their enemies with doubt. The Thunder King had used it many a time to send his warriors into a battle frenzy whilst the opposing side would shit their pants. To combat this, the Pandaren, desperate to defeat the Mogu, crafted a harmonic mallet with the power to nullify the bell's effects. But whereas the location of the mallet had been lost to time, the Horde had discovered the location of the Divine Bell. However, an Alliance adventurer also discovered the location of the Divine Bell and reported that information back to their faction. So Night Elf Sentinels, alongside specialists from the Explorers League, immediately set out to recover it. They removed the bell from its resting place and transported it back to the Night Elf capital, Darnassus, removing it completely from the war. And if that wasn't bad enough, Garrosh then learned that Lothamar Theron of the Blood Elves had recently met with Varian Rin, 
intent on changing allegiances. But, in doing so, that actually provided Garrosh with a single solution to two problems. He immediately dispatched a small horde contingent, including Blood Elf Sun Reavers specifically, with the mission of infiltrating Darnassus, killing the Sentinels, and stealing the Divine Bell. So they went ahead and did that, and the Alliance reacted in exactly the way Garrosh hoped they would. Archmage Jaina Proudmoor immediately moved to expel all of the Blood Elves residing in Dalaran in retaliation. Blood Elves, in general, could no longer be trusted. And she also declared that the Majorcratic neutral nation of Dalaran would now be more closely aligned to the Alliance, which is the opposite of being neutral. Understandably, the Blood Elves in Dalaran refused to leave quietly. This was their home, their livelihood. No one had any right to order them to abandon it. As soon as the Sun Reavers rejected Jaina's edict, the city's authorities and the Silver Covenant began to comb the city, using brutality. The Silver Covenant particularly loved this, due to their innate hatred of the Sun Reavers. Violence and chaos filled the streets, forcing many innocent Blood Elven families to flee through the sewer system. And peace did not return to Dalaran's streets until Lothamar Theron gave the order for his people to evacuate. But Lothamar was absolutely furious at Jaina for this. Any hope of the Blood Elves joining the Alliance was now completely gone. But the Blood Elf leader was also angry at Garrosh. The Warchief had gone completely over his head when ordering his people to steal the Divine Bell. And deep down, Lothamar knew that it had been Garrosh that had been the ultimate cause of this disastrous purge. Garrosh could no longer be allowed to remain in power. So, Lothamar quietly ordered his surviving Sun Reavers to begin preparing for insurrection. The moment Garrosh showed any weakness, he was a dead man. But, with the Divine Bell now in his possession, Garrosh started to amass his Corcrom warriors at Emperor's Reach in Kunlai Summit. Once his greatest champions were all in one place, he intended to ring the bell and march his frenzied force across Pandaria, meaning the Alliance's only hope now was the Harmonic Mallet, which takes us back to Anduin Rin for a bit. Since discovering and moving on from the Vale, the Prince had reconnected with the main Alliance force and his father, but his attention was now very much on thwarting the Warchief's insidious plans. So, with the help of Alliance champions, he ventured into the wilds of Pandaria, recovered the Mallet, which had been broken and scattered all over the bloody place. They then repaired the damn thing, and finally, marched on the Horde. Anduin and the Champion arrived at Emperor's Reach to find Garrosh set to ring the bell. Unfortunately, it looked like they might be too late. But, the bell didn't work exactly as the legends had claimed they would. Its noise did more than fill the listeners' hearts with fury. It straight up infused them with the power of the Shah, transforming them into hideous creatures of pure rage. The Shah infused warriors smashed into the Alliance champions, so the heroes went ahead and took some more ass, clearing a path so that Anduin could reach the bell. The prince then attempted to dissuade the Warchief from his campaign of violence, but Garrosh didn't give a shit, simply striking the bell once again, causing his blade master Ishii to become infused with Shah corruption as well. Once again, the champions stepped in to protect their prince, and Anduin, finally, used the harmonic mallet, nullifying the bell's effect. However, this made Garrosh very angry. He hit out, violently, shattering the Divine Bell and causing the extremely heavy ancient artifact to topple and bury Anduin, and then buggered off in a strop with his remaining forces, believing the young prince to now be dead. The bell may have been worthless, but at least he'd managed to strike a blow to the Alliance by removing their heir to the throne. After he left though, Alliance champions pulled Anduin out from under all the debris. He was alive, but not exactly doing well. His body was completely broken. He was going to need the best healers. So, word was sent to the best healers. Pandaren monks known as Mistweavers. And Anduin was sent to the Vale of Eternal Blossoms to recover. And told to stay there. However, he didn't do that. Instead, he continued his journey through Pandaren. Coming upon a young black dragon named Rathian at the Tavern in the Mists. A young black dragon who was claiming to be a lost son of Deathwing. However, Rathian did not reveal his true intentions to Anduin. Simply seemed like a nice guy that was offering to help and stuff. But in truth, he had travelled to Pandaria after experiencing a vision of Azeroth's destruction. Flashes of a world consumed by Felflame, with Sargeras and his burning legion returning to Azeroth. It was Rathian's intention to prepare the world for this coming war. In his opinion, the only way this world could possibly win was if they faced Sargeras as a unified force, 
which seems reasonable enough, but also in his opinion, either the Horde or the Alliance would need to be crushed, with anyone who cared about the future of Azeroth seeking to throw their weight behind the stronger of the two factions. He was only offering to assist the Horde and Alliance in order to gain intelligence on their strengths and weaknesses. Meanwhile, whilst all of that stuff was going on, another faction had been quietly at work in Kunlai, the Zandalari Trolls. They'd obviously heard of the rediscovery of the long lost continent of Pandaria and had immediately boarded their ships in order to conquer the place. See, the Zandalari had lost an awful lot over the years. Accompanying Lei Shen to Old Doom had led to many of their leaders being exploded, which had created a power vacuum in their society. And on top of that, the Sundering had turned their home of Zandalar into nothing more than a small island, isolating and weakening them further. And while some Zandalari had accepted their lot in life, one contingent led by a prophet called Zul did not. They very much wanted to restore the glory of the Zandalari Empire. Zul did not inform King Rastakhan of this. He knew the Zandalari King would not sanction conquest. But who cares? Zul had a plan. A plan to resurrect an ancient strong ally of their people. Buried beneath Kunlai's summit, all they needed to do was steal the body of Lei Shen, the Thunder King, and all would be right in the world. Warden Alliance champions accompanying Law Walker Cho to the Mogashan vaults in Kunlai almost uncovered this plot, but they didn't. They destroyed much of the Mogu's cache of ancient weaponry, but failed to uncover the extent of Zul's scheme. By the time anyone was able to piece together what the Zandalari were up to, it was too late. Lei Shen's body was already gone, taken to the Isle of Reckoning. And back with Vol'jin again. The leader of the Darkspear Trolls continued to lick his wounds. Time with the Shadowpan had done him some good, but there were still a few injuries remaining that just stubbornly refused to heal. Initially, this just seemed like lingering effects from the poison, but as the weeks went on, Vol'jin realized the issue was him. His mind and heart were conflicted. Long ago, Vol'jin had sworn an oath to protect the Horde at all costs. But now, he was seriously considering a desperate plan to destroy it. He needed some guidance. But his head was so muddled that even the lower were not answering his prayers. But during this time, in the Shadowpan's care, Vol'jin connected with another refugee. A human named Tirithan Kort. And their unlikely friendship prompted the Darkspear leader to meditate on the paths that lay before him. What kind of leader did he want to be? This little bit of introspection led him to receiving a vision of troll history. The past, the present, a possible future that he might create. A reminder of who the trolls were and who they could be. All depending on the direction that he set his people to. Now Vol'jin really wanted a nice future for the trolls, not a shit one. And for that, he gained the respect of the Lower of Death, Bon Samdi. This very cool lower returned Vol'jin's ability to heal, causing his injuries to fade away, apart from some scars that were left as a reminder of the mistakes he'd made. And Vol'jin also felt his connection with the lower return, in full. Now he was ready to face Garrosh. It was time to return to the Echo Isles. His people needed him. Thrall needed him. However, he didn't get to leave because the monastery then immediately fell under siege by a bunch of Zandalari trolls led by another prophet, Kalak. Kalak had a bunch of prisoners, including Chen Stormstout, and she used the prisoners to force Vol'jin out into the open. She wanted to talk. She knew that Vol'jin held no love for Garrosh. The Darkspear tribe could handsomely bolster the Zandalari forces, and she showed him a vision of a united troll empire, one that would rival the glory of ancient times, with the Darkspears liberated and elevated above all others. And for a moment, Vol'jin considered this before saying, no, piss off. You're living in the past, and you know better than Garrosh himself. Vol'jin now sought to protect his kind, not sacrifice them in pursuit of power and glory. He then helped the Shadowpan to repel the invaders. It was a hard battle, but in the end, the Pandaren emerged victorious, with Vol'jin besting Kalak using his newfound monk skills. And then, he and Chen stormed out, buggered off. Destination, the Echo Isles. Back to Lei Shen again again. The Thunder King was now up and about having been resurrected with Dark Juju. And from his ancient throne on the Isle of Thunder, he convened with his War Council. He was bloody furious to learn that the Pandaren had taken control of this continent, but he was also pretty confident that they would bend the knee in the face of his fearsome might. After all, he still had the power he'd stolen from High Keeper Ra, so ain't nobody gonna stand against him. However, 
unbeknownst to him, Taranju of the Shadowpan was already plotting a way to return the Thunder King to his tomb. But first, he was going to need assistance to overcome Lei Shen's defences on the Isle. And lucky for him, Horde and Alliance reinforcements were just now arriving. Lothamar Theron and a bunch of Sun Reavers arrived in Pandaria in search of Mogu weapons that would help them in their rebellion against Garrosh. Whilst Jaina Proudmoore, still upset about all the Divine Bell stuff, had caught wind of Lothamar's journey and followed him, bringing a contingent of Kirin Tor with her. She was determined to find out what they were up to, and if necessary, take their asses. But these two opposing groups soon found themselves working together as they collided with the forces of Shan Bu, one of the Thunder King's generals. This Mogu general was attempting to resurrect Nalak, a mighty storm dragon, and managed to succeed in doing that. But the Lothamar and Jaina peeps banded together, took the general's name and ass, and then agreed to temporarily turn their collective anger towards their common enemies, Lei Shen and also Garrosh. First, they took a moment to reassess their forces. Then they tracked down Nalak, the storm dragon, and kicked that thing in the tits. And then, heroes of the Alliance, Horde, and Pandaria marched on the Throne of Thunder itself. After facing elite Zandalari forces outside, the champions were forced to fight their way through the fortress from the bottom up, facing horrible experiments and twisted fauna in the Forgotten Depths. Then, ascending into the Halls of Flesh Shaping, where they faced even more experiments and stuff, things like the Dark Animus, a mechanical monster which Lei Shen had poured his unbridled rage into, just a whole bunch of raid bosses and trash mobs, and exploding snails that destroyed pretty much every LFR group that ever existed. And after all of that, they reached the Pinnacle of Storms and faced Lei Shen himself. The Thunder King brought the full weight of his power against the champions, but ultimately, ass. <laughs> ass taken. With the Thunder King dead, Jaina directed the Alliance to drain the power from Lei Shen's palace, so that none could ever use it again. However, there was one source of power that could not easily be eliminated. Lei Shen's heart, which held the immense arcane power taken from the Titan Keeper Ra. So long as the heart existed, there would always be a chance that the Thunder King could return. So, Rathian, the Black Dragon Prince, requested that it be brought to him. He then immediately consumed it, causing his mind to briefly connect with the ancient arcane powers of the Keepers. And in that moment, he saw a vision, showing him the truth of the Titan's fate, all slain by Sargeras and the Legion. Even after thousands of years, there were people on Azeroth that truly believed the Titans would one day return and restore peace. But Rathian now knew that this was bollocks. No one was coming. The people of this planet were going to have to save themselves. And this absolutely horrified Rathian for a few seconds before the vision disappeared and Rathian completely forgot everything he'd learned. All that remained was a deep sense of unease within the Prince as well as a renewed desire to prepare for the coming invasion. It was now Rathian's opinion that this war in Pandaria needed to end. The world could not simultaneously fight the Legion and itself. Meanwhile, in a Titan vault far beneath the Veil of Eternal Blossoms, Garrosh had now uncovered something very bad. It was a vault that had been constructed by Highkeeper Ra, and its purpose was the study of the Heart of Yasharaj. Horde agents delivered the heart to their warchief, who immediately sensed its potential as a weapon, but time had weakened the old god's powers within it. It was going to need a little bit of rejuvenation. So Garrosh, being a very clever bloke, moved the heart to the waters of the Vale, the ones that everyone has been going on and on about for the entire expansion. Upon arrival, Garrosh was confronted by Taran Zhu, but the Lord of the Shadowpan was massively outnumbered and defeated by the Warchief in single combat almost immediately. Garrosh then dropped the heart into the Vale's waters, and in an instant, they turned a murky black, with the surrounding flora withering away and the sky itself beginning to darken. And with that achieved, Garrosh buggered off, taking the heart and his loyalists back to Orgrimmar, leaving Pandaria completely. Garrosh's plan moving forward was to forge a new horde, one in the image of the original. Only the strongest orcs would be allowed to join this true horde, bolstered by a minority of useful lesser races. His words, not mine. Those who did not meet his standards were not invited. Now, when the Alliance, Horde and Pandaren returned to the Vale from the Isle of Thunder, they were a little bit shocked. The entire place was now scarred with Shah corruption. So they did a little investigating with the assistance of Lord Walker Cho and discovered some Mogu ruins that had recently revealed themselves. Inside, a Shah corrupted manifestation of the Vale's waters rose up to oppose them. So they slapped that thing around for a bit. 
The champions then advance through the corruption bit by bit, until finally coming upon the Titanic Watcher Nurashen. He had failed in his charge to protect the vault against Garrosh's forces, and was determined to not fail again. The heart of Yusharaj may be gone, but the Shower of Pride had awoken, and was hanging about inside the vault. Nurashen was not going to allow Pride to use the champions as its vessel, so the heroes were going to need to face Nurashen, purge themselves of their pride in battle. So they did. After that, they head inside the vault proper, discovering a badly injured Taran Jew because that bloke gets bloody everywhere apparently. He explained that this was all that asshole Garrosh's fault, and was quickly escorted out and asked to get word to Lothamar and Jaina for assistance. Whilst the champions went ahead and pulled the Shah itself. It was a big one, but obviously no match for our heroes because we're all Bloody Mary slash Gary Stews. However, the Titanic Watcher Nurashem was lost during the battle because he did not have plot armor. Jaina and Lothamar then arrived, after the Shah's defeat, so that was nice of them. They noted the evidence linking Garrosh to the Vale's corruption and agreed to extend their ceasefire once more. Meanwhile again, Thrall arrived at the Echo Owls, finally, with a horde champion that was just kind of tagging along. And they immediately found the place under martial law by a force of Garrosh's Corcoran guards. With a slightly heavy heart, Thrall and the champion were forced to dispatch said orcs, whilst rallying the Darkspears as they made their way across the island. Vol'jin arrived home shortly after this to find his people already liberated, but the fight wasn't over yet, not whilst Garrosh still held control over the Horde. So, Vol'jin, Thrall, Chen, the liberated Darkspear trolls, and anyone else who wanted to tag along made their way very loudly from Senjin village to Orgrimmar. Bane Bloodhoof and the Tauren joined along the way, as well as some goblins within the Bilgewater cartel who outfitted the marching rebellion with heavy weaponry. And once Doritar and the barons were secured, Vol'jin set his sights on the final piece required to unseat Garrosh, the Alliance. King Varian Rin was very okay with the idea of deposing Garrosh, so a war fleet was sent across the Great Sea and through the combined efforts of said Warfleet and ground forces on Kalimdor, the naval blockade on the continent crumbled, allowing not only Alliance forces but also Forsaken, Blood Elven and others to make landfall as well. It was almost as if all of Azeroth had united against Garrosh. However, still wasn't going to be an absolute cakewalk. Defensively, Garrosh had outfitted the city with a myriad of Black Fuse Company weaponry. He had forces from the Dragonmore clan, he had his elite Corcoran warriors, General Nazgrim, who'd returned from Pandaria with a whole bunch of Mantid, all pledged to Garrosh. So it was pretty even Stevens at the gates of Orgrimmar, between the Rebellion and Garrosh's forces, right up until Tyrande Whisperwind and her Night Elf Sentinels arrived. Their siege weapons turned the tides of the battle at the gates, allowing Horde and Alliance heroes to head on inside. They were a little bit shocked as soon as they entered the city. People, including G Firepaw, were being openly tortured in the streets basically anyone deemed to have questionable loyalty. But this just made the rebels even angrier. So they slashed their way through Garrosh's army and rescued all of those prisoners. Next, the champions head through Ragefire Chasm, encountering General Nazgrim. The bloke didn't even believe in Garrosh's vision for the Horde, but he'd sworn an oath, and he wasn't going to dishonor that. So the champions took his ass, but felt kind of bad about it. And at that point, all that remained was the war chief himself. Thrall was the first to arrive at the raid's innermost chamber, and despite his shamanic discipline, he could barely contain his anger. He'd vouched for Garrosh, helped the bloke ascend to the position of war chief, only for Garrosh to betray his trust, murder his friends, and violate everything the Horde stood for. Garrosh deserved nothing but death for everything he'd inflicted on the world, but Thrall would still offer him a chance to surrender, an offer which Garrosh said fuck off to, go big or go home. And to be honest, Thrall kind of hoped that would be the case. He took up his Doomhammer and charged at his former friend, but with the heart of Yusharaj and Dark Shamans at his disposal, Thrall was pretty helpless. He wasn't going to be able to best the Warchief alone, but thankfully, we were there to back him up. And against our awesome godlike might, Garrosh fell. Jobs are good. However, Surprisingly, as Thrall raised his Doomhammer intent on striking a killing blow, Varian then stepped in. He agreed with Thrall's anger, but argued the Shaman was not the only person who should decide Garrosh's fate. Everyone deserved to have a say in it. And reluctantly, Thrall agreed. Taranju and the Shadowpan then escorted the fallen warchief away in chains, to face trial in Pandaria, 
because that was the land where he committed most of his atrocities. And all was right in the world. The Horde then quickly moved to instate a new war chief, with Vol'jin asking Thrall to return to his former seat. However, Thrall declined and nominated Vol'jin instead. It was he who had sparked the rebellion and had held the Horde together, and the rest of the Horde leaders agreed, so Vol'jin was war chief now. The Alliance then reminded everyone they were still in the room, as Varian issued a final warning before departure. The Horde and Alliance were at peace, but only for now. Yes, they might be under new leadership, but that did not absolve them of their past crimes. They were going to need to earn the Alliance's trust, and if there was any sign of them playing silly buggers, Varian would not hesitate to resume hostilities. And with that, he left. And the only thing worth mentioning before we end this video and move on to the Warlords of Draenor stuff in the next episode, Rathian, still in Pandaria, stood silently as the August Celestials and Risen Emperor Shaohao worked to restore the Veil. And he was ever so slightly concerned. This new state of peace was tenuous and had come at great cost to all involved. In his mind, the Alliance should have used their army to annihilate the Horde in Orgrimmar, whilst they were at their weakest. And it was shit that they hadn't done that.